Hallelujah. This is called release of the spirit. I mean, you got when you get born again, your spirit comes alive, right? I mean, you need to let that guy out. Um, that's why it's called the release of the spirit. Um, he don't always get to get out like he wants to, because um, a lot of times our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, uh, they kind of dictate what we what we do. Amen. Okay. Um, so the more dealings we have with our soul, we get we get this guy. It's like children. I mean, if you if you train children you, and to obey, how I many they're fun to fellowship? I mean, what happens if you leave children to themselves and just let them do what they want? Well, they're called brats. I don't know what you call them, but they're a lot of people call them brats. They just they they'll embarrass you if you, take, if you take them out in public. They'll sit in a restaurant and throw food across the room, yell and scream. People around you start ducking their heads and it's like, oh man, you know, because these are unruly children. Now. Your soul is like a child, and it, you can either, it's, it's not automatic that you grow up. I'm 61 years old. You know, I just recently grew up. <laughs> just anchor your soul. You, you don't always grow up. You know, you can say, you ever see somebody that's, that's 15, uh, and they're 50, that not much has changed? They still act like they're 15? See, you can get older and not necessarily grow up, because you can stay selfish. I mean, a 15 year old is pretty selfish. Well, it's all about him. But we can get older, but not necessarily grow up. The object is uh, we try to teach in this house a lot how to grow up, how to mature, how to um, uh, get whole, where your spirit, soul, and body are working in agreement together and you're accomplishing the purpose of God. You're actually doing the things you want to do. Instead of, I hate when I, you know, aren't you tired of saying, man, I hate when I do that. Man, I'm so tired of, I wish I'd quit, get over that. You think this would be gone by now. We want to get past that where we can say, you know, that thing's been so gone in my life, it's a blessing. I haven't, I haven't got angry, I mean crazy angry in a long time. We all get, you know, hello, we all lose it every once in a while. But isn't it nice to recover in a decent amount of time? Like in a few minutes instead of a few days. There's some people be are angry at people for some for years. I've had people be mad at me for years. <laughs> it's like, come on, get over it. But you know, people can hold a grudge. Or sometimes you get mad at yourself and you hate that you did something stupid. The Bible says when you do that, go to Jesus, ask him to forgive you. He forgives you, forgets about it, and then says, All right, go on. Get up, move on. No, 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 I gotta I gotta pay for that one. I gotta punish myself all day and walk around and act like I'm not. Well, if Jesus is, if he's, isn't he, isn't he the boss? When I, last I checked, he's still in charge. If he's forgiven you and says get up and go on and go and sin no more, then we should be able to do that. You know, it's pride or false humility. False humility is pride. Uh, it says, well, you know. I'm I'm too mature of a Christian. And see that I just can't let myself off the hook. I've got to pay for this at least for a few hours today. So I'm going to go read my Bible. You know, if you read your Bible with the wrong with the wrong mindset, you don't get much of it. You ladies ever been mad at your husband and go read your Bible? What did you really get out of that? I'm going to go pray for you, honey. If you're angry, you know God don't even hear those prayers. Oh, he hears mine. No, he don't. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Storm in the storm in the in the in the house of God or in, in his presence and see how how well you're received. I used to hear Pentecostal people say, We're gonna bombard heaven. Why? The gates are open. We're gonna bombard heaven with prayer. We're gonna Assault the gates, the, the gates of the kingdom. They're not closed to you and me. Amen. It's, it's, you know, it's got this Rambo mentality. We're gonna we're gonna force something over on God. You know, it's the Father's delight to give you the kingdom. He wants to bless you. He likes. He loves you. He wants to do for you. How many earthly daddies like to do things for your kids? Man, I do. 
Amen? Not just on their birthday. They kind of expect that at Christmas. You know, they expect those two days to be big days. What about those days that that's just just a normal day and you and you get something cool for them? And just to watch them just watch them freak out. Dad, it's not my birthday. I know. It's not even Christmas, Dad. I know. This is a hoverboard, Dad. I know. They're like four hundred dollars. I know. I just wanted to bless you. See, it's days like that that set seals in your children that they don't easily come away with. It makes them feel, but I didn't do anything to deserve it. I know. You're my son. I just love you. Isn't that how our Heavenly Father is? How many of you have ever been blessed after you did something really stupid? Everybody raise your hand. Everybody, come on. Y'all sit there like, oh, I don't know. I only get blessed when I do cool things. No. God blesses you in spite of you sometimes. You know, sometimes I've done some dumb things and then I repent and then I turn around and the Lord's just, you know, I get a check in the mail or something ridiculous. Oh my gosh, what is this about? God, I can't receive, of course, I don't, I, I just talk myself into it. Thank you. <laughs> it's too much, okay. And what, what happens with that? Don't you just feel undone? Isn't that the Father's love just being poured out on you? He's letting you know, hey, I'm over it. Get over it. I, I don't. I, I like fellowship in you. I don't like you being outside the, the 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 throne room. I don't like you standing in the corner. We do that to ourselves sometimes. God, I'm not even going to pray right now. I'm just going to go stand in the corner. And God's like, wow, how long is this going to last? Well, probably several hours, maybe maybe even a day or two. Bummer, because I really love you and I'd love to spend time with you, but you're going to punish yourself even though my word says you're forgiven. I know it says that, but I feel, feel. I mean, we take, we, when you exalt your feelings above the word of God, that's bad. Amen? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. All right, that's my intro. Who's in charge, your spirit or your soul? We'd love to say, I'm, I'm a spirit-led. I'm a spirit-led man. I'm only led by the Spirit. Well, let's find out. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5. Mm-hmm. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, the word lust just means a a fervent desire for, okay? You could have a, you could lust for donuts, okay? You have a, you have a fervent desire for donuts or bucket of chicken, okay? Or for money or for whatever. Um, So it says, for this I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh or the lust of the flesh. For the, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. How I many of your, your flesh wants to do things sometimes that your spirit's not, not on board with? And I ain't talking about just sin, folks. Sin's a no-brainer. Okay? I'm talking about, you know it's okay to play? You know God's okay with you playing? I know a lady one time had a swimming pool in her, in her backyard, and she, she didn't feel worthy to swim in her own pool. You know, the devil can make you, can put you in all kind of bondage to make you feel... You know, like you can't go out and play. I mean, the Bible says for everything there's a season, a time to work, and it says a time to play. If you work all the time and you don't play, you're out of balance. You're not honoring God. So you workaholics that have a tendency to look down on the people that play too much, shame on you. That's pride. I work harder than you. Well, I can. I like to say to you, I play more than you do. You need to play. Hallelujah. Uh, What do you think you're going to do in heaven? Don't play. Don't have a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness. Um, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would, or that you wish. How many of y'all want to do right? How many of y'all want to tell the truth? Five of us. I have a house full of liars. 
You want to do the truth. You want to tell people the truth. How many of you sometimes, I want to, just, I want to hit on that because the Holy Ghost said, well, there are some folks that, you, when you exaggerate all the time, that's lying. I caught a 16-pound bass. Really? Do you have evidence of that? How about I just caught a fish? We sometimes hold it out in front, makes it look bigger. That's one of those optical illusion things. Yeah, look at this, look at this rascal. You pull it in, it's like <laughs> eh, okay. That's okay. You know the size fish you get. <laughs> Come on, guys. Everything's not the measure of manhood. I went surfing the other day. I caught I was on the pipeline. I caught 60 foot waves, not in San Diego. You caught some good rides. That's, can't we be okay with that? Hey, I got a new car. It's got a massive engine in it. Weren't you in that Volkswagen the other day? What does it matter? How about us be okay with who we are? God don't make junk. Everybody in this room is uniquely made. Everybody in this room is awesome. And everybody in this room, God, is you're his favorite. You're uno numero one. Well, not not everybody, brother Mike, because you can't have everybody a favorite. Well, with God you can, because He's God. He can have everybody. You know, He loves us all the same. So you that read your Bibles every day for three hours, you're not loved any more than the guy that didn't read his Bible but three times this whole week, and the guy that read his Bible three times this whole month, and the guy that didn't even pick up the pick up the book. God still loves every one of those guys the same. Now, we're all going, oh, this false doctrine here. I don't know if I, like, I, don't know if I like this guy. Because God, Lord knows, the more we spiritual things we do, the more he loves us. God's love for you is not hinged on what you do for him. For God so loved you, he sent his only begotten son to die for you. The Bible said while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were what? Sinners. He died for us. It wasn't like we were out trying to impress him. He said, they need a Savior. I'll, I'll be their Savior. We don't even want a Savior. Well, I don't care. <laughs> one day you will get the, you'll, you'll see that you do need one, and, then, and, I'll, and I'll have already paid for it. Hallelujah. So, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lusts or the desires of the flesh. Amen? So you that, it says, for, uh, for these are contrary one to another, so you that do not... So that you do not do the things that you wish. I want to do what I, what I set out the purpose to do. I want to accomplish what I set out the purpose to do. I am tired of that tug of war within myself. The devil, you give some of y'all give the devil way too much credit for being the devil. He's a fallen angel. He's a fallen angel. He only has power if you move in fear. Fear does to the devil what faith does to God. If you get in fear, you activate the devil on your behalf. You get in faith, you activate God on your behalf. Oh, I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Well, then you're going to walk. You're going to live your whole life in fear of death. I'm not afraid to die because if I die, I step out of this body and I get in. And I go to heaven, which is a far better place to be. I don't know if you've watched the news lately. This world's not, not really that, that cool of a place to live anymore. Hallelujah. So we're not afraid to die. Amen. Well, have you won the war? That's my next question. Looking at some scripture, and we're going to get into the what I want to talk about. This is all laying a foundation. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I love Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is such a good book. Romans chapter 8 it says, There is therefore now no, say no, means no more. Say that too, means no more. Or ain't no more. There you go, I'd say it right. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You know, when you become a Christian, you're under different guidelines, different laws, different rules, different regulations. We're under the law of the Spirit of life. We're not under the law of condemnation. We're not under the law of, of sin consciousness. 
I mean, before you became a Christian, you were very much aware of everything you were doing wrong because that was the devil's job to make sure he told you, you know, that's wrong. You know what you said was wrong. It's a lie. It's wrong. You know, those thoughts you're feeling, having right now, they're wrong. If people knew what you were thinking, they wouldn't even be in the room with you. Constantly, whether nobody else heard it or not, there was a voice constantly condemning you. That was not Jesus. Of course, the devil doesn't say, hey, I'm the devil. I'm here to condemn you. Because if you did, you go, well, if you're the devil, I don't have to listen to you. Y'all getting this in the balcony up there? Y'all paying attention? Okay. Tiffany, this has got your name all over, girl. Hallelujah. She's just waiting for that one. All right. For the law of the spirit of life, the spirit of life. What does, the, what does this law do? It gives life. What does the spirit of condemnation do? It gives death. Um, all right, let's look at verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, how many of the devil tells you the more spiritual you are, the less fun you're going to have? Anybody heard that lie? Just me. Wow. You got, he doesn't tell that one to you, huh? Tells me that all the time. But you know what I found? I found that to be a lie. I found the more spiritually I am minded, now I'm talking about religious. Religious people have no fun. I am not a religious person. Thank you. <laughs> See, religious people are people trying to do, trying to modify their behavior so it impresses God. They're trying to be good in their own strength. A spiritual person knows they can't do that, and they just try to live through their spirit and just tell their flesh, hey, we're going to obey God. And in most, and most of the time, we're going to please Him by the things we're doing. But sometimes we're going to mess up. But if we do, we're going to repent and move on. That's a spiritually minded man. Religious people try to live perfect. That's a task nobody can perform. All perfect. You want to be perfect? I'll tell you where to go. To heaven. You got to die to become perfect. All the perfect people are in heaven. As long as you're walking in this earth, you're not going to be perfect, and you're going to have problems, you're going to have attitudes, and you're going to lose it at times. But that's why we need a Savior. You didn't just need a Savior to get saved. You need a Savior every day. I love that Paul said, I've been delivered, I'm being delivered, and I'll be delivered when Jesus comes. It's an ongoing process. I've been delivered from the world. I'm being delivered from the world every day. And when Jesus comes, I'll be delivered totally from the world. Hallelujah. But till then, you've got to deal with some stuff. Hallelujah. You're never going to put on perfection until Jesus comes. Hallelujah. All right, so it says, goes on and says, uh, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is it? Peace. The fruit of righteousness is peace. You know, most religious people don't have peace. They're too busy. They're so, they're so sin conscious. They're always guessing, second guessing. Was that God? Was that pleasing God? You know, you have the Holy Spirit. His job is to convict you when you do something wrong. If you're not getting convicted, carry on. Carry on. Wayward. Carry on. Yeah, that's Kansas. Just paying, see if you're paying attention. The carnal ones. If you're not getting convicted, man, I'm sitting on my front porch sometimes just minding my own business, doing nothing. And a little voice will say, doing nothing. I'm, I'm right in the middle, full-blown doing nothing. I got the pedal to the metal full. I got my feet up on an ottoman, rocking back here, doing seriously nothing. And I've learned that voice is not God. That voice is the enemy. Couldn't you be praying? Yeah, I could. Couldn't you be reading your Bible? Yeah, I could. People are dying and going to hell, Brother Mike, and you're up here doing nothing. That's right. Not just nothing, full-blown nothing. Let's get this right. And you say, well, don't you feel convicted? No. No. Because there, you, the Bible says well, as you mature in the Lord, you know the, you, you know the difference between right and wrong and the voice of condemnation and the voice of truth. God don't care if you take a break. God don't care if you have vacation. You know, some of y'all work so much, you're in sin because you don't vacation. You need to play. Well, we got to get enough money in the bank. Man, some of y'all work so hard. You know, and one day you can go to the bank and just like, in, remember in the, in the Great Depression, they went to the banks, the banks didn't open the doors and everybody lost their money. That could happen again. 
Some of you are going, oh, that scares me. That's because your your faith is in your money. Do you know the money could the dollar could die tomorrow? You could go tomorrow and it'd be worth nothing. So you have a hundred thousand nothing in the bank, as opposed to my, I think it's about two hundred nothing right now. I'm waiting for payday. In Venezuela right now, it takes a bag of money to buy a loaf of bread. I'm not making this up. This is on the news. Their dollar is so depreciated, it takes a bag of money to buy a loaf of bread. You know, that's in the book of Revelations. It said it'll take a year's wage to buy a loaf of bread. That's happening right now in Venezuela. Actually, there's no food in, hardly in Venezuela because they have this socialist system that's working so well. And they're broke. And their dollar has no money. So they're going over to Colombia with all this money thinking they're going to home, come home with lots of groceries and they come home with just a few bags. And we're talking lots of money. Well, this is America, brother. Mike. That couldn't happen to the good old U.S. of A. Well, I hope not, but it could. And if it does, you know what? God's still going to provide for his people. Man, I tell you what, the great, you know, the Bible says if you're faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will, com who will commit you true riches? Mammon is money. If you're faithful with money, God will give you true riches. You know, I'd rather have true riches than, ma than money. True riches is the ability to tap into the source, of the, the power of God and accomplish what you need to accomplish. If somebody has cancer and you've got millions of dollars, but they say there's nothing we can do, you're going to die, all that money don't do you any good. But true riches, if you, have, if you can tap into the healing power of God, and it's free. Amen? You know, there's people, there's people that got lots of money but still battle depression every day. Can't even have fun with a bank full of money. Can't even have fun. Oh, man. Oh, to know Jesus. I mean know him. Not of him. Know him. Daily. Hallelujah. Let's keep reading. All right. For to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Peace. Because car the carnal mind is, is enmity against God. It's against the things of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither, can de neither indeed can be. So they that are, that are in the flesh cannot please God. How many of y'all want to please God? You know, pleasing God is not that difficult because you were created to please God. In Revelation 3 it says, Thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. You were created to please God. So when you're pleasing God, you're actually fulfilling the purpose of your creation. You were created to please God. And God loves to bless and please you. It's a wonderful relationship. You know, a 747 jet's a pretty cool jet. It works great on a runway and in the, in the, in the air. But you know, a 747 wouldn't do you a lot of good down the freeway, would it? Never going, never going. The wingspan's too long. It's not going to clear the, those under overpasses. It wasn't created to go down the freeway. It was created to fly in the heavenlies. It needs lots of room. You and I were created to have fellowship and know God. So when you're actually fellowshiping and knowing God, you're 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 living out and walking in your created purpose. I was created to be a millionaire. Lots of millionaires are miserable people. I know lots of them. They're miserable. They're always <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. You know, it's funny how these make cartoons. Some of these things are pretty accurate. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck has all this money and he's never happy, right? He needs to be more like Donald, but not with the attitude. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. So then they that in the flesh can't please God. But you're not of the flesh, but of the spirit. If so, be that you, if so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God or Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Either you're born again or you're not. Well, I, I, I believe. Well, that's good. The Bible says the, the devils believe, but we know devils aren't saved. Believe does not mean have knowledge of. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know that word believe means obey? Wow, that takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? 
God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would obey him would not perish but have everlasting life. Obeying Jesus is not the same as believing. Man, we can go down to Turkey and over there. I can go in there and witness some guys. Man, you believe in Jesus? You know I do. He's my buddy. I love Jesus. He's my man. I love trust toast Jesus. I'm not mocking him. I'm just, well, I am. Sorry. But the bottom line is they're sitting in there and they say they believe in Jesus, but why are you sitting in the dark drinking all day and having no life? Why are you numb in pain that Jesus already paid for? You can get rid of the pain. I mean, I don't condemn people that drink, but I know they're numb in pain. You know what's better than, than numb in pain? Getting rid of it so you don't have to numb anything. Well, you don't understand. My childhood was horrible. Well, let's sit down and let's have a contest to see whose childhood was the worst. I think mine, mine would get pretty close to yours. But, you know, I'm not living in the past. I'm not living with all that stuff. I've been forgiven, and I've been delivered of the spirits that remind me of it. So they're gone. So I can now just live in the moment of freedom and peace with God and enjoy life. Hallelujah. So if you're born of, if you're born of God, you're of God. If you're not born again, well, you're still in the flesh. Let's keep reading. Let's, let's look at verse 12, uh, 13. But if you be, but if you, love King James, I'm using an old Bible. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. You know what, I'm going to think, I want to break that down. You know, there's, how many of y'all are tired of doing certain things that aren't even fun anymore? I don't know why it's taken some people several decades. When I was 18 years old, I was out in the woods one night, and I said, you know what, this, this sucks. You know, getting high and doing stuff that I was doing. This got to be something better than this. This is not even fun anymore. I'm tired of lying to my parents. I'm tired of lying to people. I'm tired of lying to myself. I'm tired of trying to, you know, I, there's got to be something that makes you happy. I ain't found it. So I asked Jesus one night to come to my heart under a pine tree at 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, Jesus, if you'll take my life, make it worth living, I'll serve you. I'm done with this lifestyle. Now, aren't y'all, any, isn't anybody else done with that lifestyle? That's why I wrote, have you won the war? See, winning the war is running up a white flag saying, I quit. War's over. I'm through fighting this war against myself that I cannot even win. And I gave my heart to Jesus. And you know what he did? He killed me. Yeah, <clears throat> well, killed me dead. Because the Bible says we die to self. When, then he raises you a new cre creation in Christ Jesus. It says mortify the deeds of the flesh. Kill, the, mortify means kill. That night I just said, you know, I'm dying to all this stuff. Jesus, you kill anything in me that you, ain't, ain't of you. I'm ready to start living. And I tell you what, I got born again. The Spirit of God came through the universe, shoom, shot through there, pow, went inside me. Woohoo! Michael T. got born again. I went back and told my friends, hey man, I've been talking to God, and I'm living for Jesus from now on. And of course, my friends say, wow, pretty high, huh? <laughs> That's the group I hung with. Yeah, buddy. I said, no, I'm, I'm totally sober. I'm just, I'm through with this. I'm ready to just start living for God. And I didn't even know what I was talking about. But you know what? From that day to this day, I've been serving him. I just picked up a living Bible the next few days and started reading it. And I found out he's not that, it's not that hard to track with the Lord. You just read what he tells you to do and do what he tells you to do. And the good news is when you're born again, you don't want to do the stuff you used to do anyways. I didn't. Anybody, don't you get tired of cussing? It's such a lazy way to talk. You got like four words. And they're universal. They mean everything. Man, I'm so glad that I have a vocabulary now. Oh, Lydia, go figure. I'm so glad that I, I care. The Bible says we know we've passed from death unto life. How do we know? Because we love the brethren. I actually care about people in this room I've never met. Hoss, I love you, buddy. James, James, I love your brother. He's cool. Got that... Brotherhood of the beards going on. I don't even know him. 
but love him. Well, how, do you, how can you say you love him if you don't know him? Because you don't have to know everybody. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. God pours so much love in you, it just spills out on everybody. I don't have a little spoonful walk around just figuring who I'm going to share it with. I got a, Jesus said, out of the bellies of men shall flow, flow rivers of living water. We have an abundance with God. One of his names is El Shaddai. More than enough. That's how I know I'm a Christian, as I love people that I don't even know. Run into them all the time. When I'm pumping gas, I'm talking to people. Wow, we know that about you, Pastor. We pray for you. Good. Keep praying. It's working. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm touching lives. I get to. Hallelujah. Not at what's your job. You have to. No. Don't have to. I get to. Want to. All right. Keep reading. Verse 14 says, um, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's awesome. If you have not received the spirit of uh, spirit of bondage again to, to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. You know that word Abba is such a cool word. It's all the tenderness of a daddy, but all the respect of a father. That's who God is. All the tenderness of a daddy. I, mean, I picture me as a son of God and God sitting on the throne and me crawling up on his lap like a little kid. And if he's got a Snickers bar in his robe, he's got a pocket there, I'm sure he does. If he's got a Snickers bar there, I'm like, uh, what you going to do with that Snickers bar? Well, the one here in my robe? Yeah. Can I have it? You would ask God for his only Snickers? He's God. He, make, he makes Snickers all day long. Some of you are going, I don't even like Snickers. Okay. Almond Joy, whatever your candy bar is. Point is, I'm sitting on his lap, and I know that if I want that, I can ask him, and he'll give it to me. Well, how do you know he will? Because he's God. His nature is that God so loves, he gave. It's the nature of God to give. God loves to give. You know, when, when you defeat the enemy of selfishness in your life, you'll find you'll take on a new nature. You know, you know what your new nature will be? It'll be God's nature. And God's nature is the nature of giving. The Bible says we've been, in, in 1 Peter it says that we've been made partakers of his divine nature. We have been made partakers, Beth, of his divine nature. What is the nature of God? He loves to give. He loves to forgive. He loves to bless. He loves to show mercy. He loves to show mercy. He loves to be kind. He loves to be loving. He loves to put joy. You know, when you get to heaven, you're going to find the throne room of God. It'll be easy to find. It's where all the laughter's coming out of. Some of y'all can't even comprehend that. No, no, that's where the thunderbolts and the... the oh, somebody's walking in there with, with black hair and walking out white-haired. Oh, my gosh, I saw God. I don't know what heaven you're going to. <laughs> but the joy of the Lord is your strength. How many folks like to laugh? Only if I have to. Most of us want to. We, do you know your body releases chemicals? When I mean, Not just any little chuckle. I'm talking about those good old belly gut busting laughs when you fall on the floor and you almost wet yourself. You know, those kind of laughs. Some of you are going, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had one of those. Shame on you, poor person. The average person in America laughs three times a day. Who are these poor people? Three times a day. Oh, get ready. It's noon. Ready for my midday chuckle. <laughs> I'm, the average person laughs three times a day. See, lady, what's your name? Angela. So you just have one of those. <laughs> I watched you. You released in your body at that just a second ago chemicals that actually wars against stress and things in your body. You released healing in your body when you just laughed a second ago. Because she had one of those little... It was silent, but I... It was, yeah, she's doing it again. <laughs> it's contagious. I mean, when you laugh, you're, the Bible says in book Proverbs, it says, laughter does, a merry heart does good like a medicine. A merry heart means laughter. So when you're laughing, you're releasing pheromones and hormones and chemicals in your bodies that are letting, you know, the, you that worry, 
It's like those, those little balsa airplanes, balsa, made out of balsa wood. You had the propeller on it, the big old rubber band. Remember those things? And you'd sit there with the propeller as little, as little kids, and you'd wind that thing for an hour. And that poor little rubber band, it could cut off your finger if it ever got away from you. And you'd get out there, and you'd, and there, off it would go. Do you know when you worry and stress, that's what physically goes on in your body? The veins in your body and the blood vessels in your body begin to twist, and they begin to get kinked, and it restricts the flow of blood in your body. When you laugh, you're releasing some of that. Life of the flesh is in the blood. So you know what builds, you know what builds blood pressure? Restricted blood flow. You kink the hose. It builds pressure. So if you will just simply let God be God and lighten up. Hear the word of the Lord. Lighten up. What about Mike preach on Sunday? Well, I, I, what I got out of it was lighten up. And you'll live longer. You will. Lighten up. Quit worrying about everything. Well, that's my job. Worry is the absence of faith. Worry says, God, this is too big for you. I got to take this on myself. Electric bill this month is, is fifty dollars more than last month. Whoo! It's going to break the bank of heaven. I, I got this one, God. Oh, what are we going to do? 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 And you just start worrying. And what you're doing is you're twisting those little blood vessels, and it's restricting the flow of life in your body, and you're working against the very thing that God wants you to be free of. Your blood is supposed to flow freely through your body because the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's bringing life. So, lighten up. You know what the Holy Spirit's job is? To tell you every time you do this. He's going, hey, what are you doing? Nothing. Aren't we? We're, we're so guilty of He says, what are you doing? Well, I have to, I have to power it up. Well, it's not by your power, it's by my power. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You don't need to do this. Quit running on your power, let me do it. He says, take the rubber band and the propeller off and watch it. Well, then it will have no source. And God goes, well, good, then I'll have to be the wind beneath its wings. Then I'll have to be the breath that carries it. And then it will be totally me that gets the glory because there was nothing about you that did it. See, the more we, the more, the less it's about you, the more it's about God, and God really loves to do that kind of stuff. My friend Carol, hello, Carol. I heard she was blessed this week. I went over and painted some rooms for her because I like to paint, and she needed some help. Man, Tiffany was telling me the other day. She said, "Brother Mike, the thing that blessed my mom the most was you listen to good music." I do. I have Spotify on my phone. I got like probably several hundred albums. You know, all spiritual, no doubt. Uh, there's a few of those in there. Oh, just music, good music. And she could not believe that this, this man of God was painting her apartment and listening to the Commodores. And listening to, you know, the Eagles. And Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And Dan Fogelberg, and on, 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 James Taylor. So you're going, none of those are Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wind her up. Wind her up, you religious people. Wind her up. Stress out if you want to. I know what I'm going to be doing this week. I'm going to be praying for you. Oh, my gosh. Well, you can waste time on that prayer, or you can be praying for people that are lost that really need it. And she said, you know, you know what she said? She said, at one point, I was over there painting, and I heard Carol go, she goes, my, my, my. I, I, I want to investigate what that is. And she said, all these years, 20 years, all that good music. <laughs> she acknowledged it was good music. She was in a church that told her she couldn't listen to nothing but sacred music. You know, there's a lot of music that's, you know, it's ed it can be edifying without having to be spiritual. You know, love songs are singing about love. I mean, you know, God wants us to love one another. So I'm just listening to music, painting, having a good time. And she's, you know, what struck her, the, the whole thing was, wow, this, 
preacher can actually paint and listen to music and and not feel condemned in the process. See, I want to tell you, I want to, I want you to be free. I want you to know Jesus because Jesus will make you free. Hallelujah. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. We've not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. How do you know you're saved? Because somebody tells you? No. Because you do all the do's and don't do the don'ts? I know a lot of people that do that that aren't saved. The Bible says our spirit, our spirit bears witness with his spirit that you're the sons of God. It's the spirit of God in you that witnesses with the spirit of God. It's your spirit getting a thumbs up from the Father going, when you ask yourself, God, am I okay with you? And you, and you, and you hear God say back, well, of course you are. That's how you know you're saved. You have the witness of the spirit. Not the approval of man. Oh my goodness, some men will never approve of it. There's people that don't approve of the way I dress. They don't approve of my beard. I had some guy had trouble with the fact that I like wearing these little puka shells or whatever. It's my tie. That's my tie. Hallelujah. They don't approve. How are you going to build this church if you don't get the dress for success? You don't wear the power tie. Because I'm not building a church on a tie. Building the truth on the church on the truth. It's all about building. It's about Jesus, not about men, anyways. All right, so we're through with Romans. Have you won the war? How do you win the war? Number one, you just surrender. You surrender. You say, I give up. When you, you gave up my office one day and said, I give up, prayed a simple prayer. You got born again. Yeah, but my life's still not perfect. Well, hello, 43 years later, mine's not either but I'm enjoying the journey. I'm not living under that law of sin and death. See, there's a law. If there's a, if there's a law of the Spirit, there's a law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, is, is, is what does it produce? Sin and death. It produces death. It condemns you. It makes you feel like you're never good enough. God's mad at you all the time. You, you know, you go to want to go, want to talk to God in prayer and you, and you look at, I don't know if you guys had this growing up. We had it. I, I look back now and think that is so carnal. We used to have this little thing in our in our kitchen. It had little puppies on it, and all these dogs had our had our one of our names on it. There was the Mike dog, the Joe dog, the Teresa dog, and then there was the dog house. And who we, you know? How do you know you're in the dog house? Well, you just have to look at the little picture because there it is. I was in there quite a bit. It was my second home, you know, and it's just that is. I just thought about that. I hadn't thought about that, and probably. 40 years, but there, I grew up knowing when I was, when I wasn't in the doghouse and when I was. I mean, oh God, that's not, that's not the way God works. He doesn't put, you know, you in the doghouse to go, eh, don't mess with me right now. I don't want to talk to you. I'm mad at you. Now I'll tell you something. Sin will separate you from God. And the Bible says, if you sin, you, you need to repent. So don't, you know, that's the first thing you need to do is repent so you, so you can pick up the phone and call God. Okay. But God doesn't put us in the doghouse. He doesn't disapprove of us. He's not, he doesn't label us and saying, you know, you're, you're a rebel. Hallelujah. Win the, war by, win the war by saying, you know, I'm through. I'm done. I'm not going to live this way anymore. How many of y'all have made that decision? I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm, I purpose to live a different way. And the only way you can do it is with Christ anyway. That's how you win the war. You have battles along the way, but I've already won the war. I'm going to heaven when I die. What if you mess up along the way? What do you mean, what if? I can help you out. There ain't no if to it. I'm sure I'm going to mess up you know, before it's all over. But I'm gonna, if I fall, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall. What? Though he fall. That's the next part of that verse. Though he fall. It's like God knows you're going to fall. He, even if you don't, he does. Though you fall. He shall not be utterly cast down. The Lord won't kick you when you're down. It says, but the Lord picks him up, upholds him with his hand. 
The steps of a good man. Not a sinner, a good man. Ordered by the Lord. God's ordering your steps, though he fall. I mean, David was a good man. Loved God. When kings go to battle, David stayed, David stayed home. What? When kings go to battle, David was a king. David stayed home. David's at the wrong place at the wrong time right now. A few verses later, we find David sitting on the roof just, you know. <laughs> and he looks over and sees some woman taking a bath. Hubba, hubba. Woo. Calls one of his servants, hey, tell her to come on up here. He's king. He can do that. Problem is, she's married. Hello? Y'all know the story. Do you think he fell? Well, yeah, yeah, he fell. That's, that's New Old Testament. That's still falling. Then they had, 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 his, had her husband killed. Trying to cover it up. You know what? When the prophet came to him and says, you the man, David began to repent. And years later, God writes about David, said, David is a man after my own heart. This was after the fall, not before. David, God loved David. You know why he loved David? Because David knew how to repent. He knew how to get right. All right. You win the war? Have you won the war? Anybody won the war? Me and Tiff and Kevin. Thank you, Jesus. Dave, come on. Keep coming. Matt's won the war. We won the war. Yeah, we won. I'm afraid if I do this, I'm going to have the week from hell. I know I'm going to have it. That's how you know you won. Hallelujah. All right. This is what I want to talk to you about. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. One thing that the Holy Spirit's job is he shows you things to come. I mean, I want the Holy Spirit involved in your everyday life. Not just in what house to buy, what car to buy, who to marry, what school to go to. Not the big decisions. The everyday decisions. This is funny. You're going to get a kick out of this. In John chapter 16, verse 12 through 14, it says, Jesus says, I have many things I have to share with you, but you can't bear them right now, or you can't understand them. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will show you things to come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, give me honor, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. I've got a visual aid for you. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Yeah, turn that camera on, buddy. Zoom on in here. Get the full the full manifestation. These are Billy Bob teeth. Yeah. No, I, I pulled my dentures out. This is what it really looked like. I was in a southern state one time, and I, I, I do I'm a trickster. I like to do things like freak people out. Sometimes people come to my office and they they already feel like they're in the principal's office, so I'll pop these in. I'll turn around and go, hey, how's it going? Ah! <laughs> Just to lighten it up a little bit because, you know, I'm that kind of guy. I was telling my dentist the other day, you know, that, that flaw stuff you gave me ain't working. I, been, <laughs> I had to go up a couple, good, couple notches, went down to the hardware store, got some rope. That boy, <laughs> that rope works real good, boy. I was over at the store the other day at a restaurant at uh, Olive Garden and told the waitress, I said, is that fettuccine going to get stuck in my teeth? Because I don't want no, no stuff not stuck in my teeth. I actually did do that to a waitress. I had I used, I used to take this with a lot of places, and I was on a date with Brenda one time. We were at Olive Garden, and I just kind of slipped them in, and I looked at that waitress and said, is that fettuccine going to get stuck in my teeth? Because I don't want no stuff. And then, man, she just said, the lady was like, ah! <laughs> Folks, I do it for the effect. Yeah. I do it for the laughter. I read in the Bible, it says, we are counted fools all the day long for his sake. I got that scripture working. <laughs> now, I'm in, I'm in Kentucky. And I'm at these people's houses. And I hear the door open. And some people are coming in. So I was in my room and I got, to, got these off the dresser and I popped them in. I'm walking down the hallway. And the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh-uh-uh. 
And so, he did. He said, Mike, take those out and go put them up. So I'm halfway down the hall, and I was like, oh, well, what's that, what, what that's about? I go on, I put them on my dresser. I walk back out there, and I walk in this room, and there's a lady had one of the biggest overbites I've ever seen in my life. I mean, her teeth were just stuck way out there. But here I'm going to tell you something. The Lord doesn't want to embarrass anybody. Not even me, and surely not this other person. So God knew what I didn't know was coming up. He'll show you things to come. I want to tell you, if y'all are tired of getting embarrassed, listen to the Lord. I mean, y'all are tired of putting that, having that your foot in your mouth too many times. I just want to say one more thing. <clears throat> Three hours later. How about we just listen to him? He told me, take them out, put them up. And I did. And I went out there and I, then I realized, oh my gosh, thank you, Jesus. That, would have, that might have been construed as making fun of her. I'm so thankful that the Lord knows how to spare everybody's feelings. Because you that think that God just goes around throwing lightning bolts at people because <laughs> he's God. No, that's Zeus. That's not God. You get out of this Greek mythology and pick up your Bible. That's, you know, God wants to bless people, wants to love people, wants to protect people. Lord knows he don't want to hurt people's feelings. So something as simple as that, he was he's mindful of. He'll show you things to come. That's just so as deep as it gets. No, the Lord showed me. He shows me things every day, all the time, about people's lives. Show me things about your life one time, Hoss, that changed your life. Showed me something about your life, Dave, one time that changed your life. Still changing. A prophetic word that went over you 11 years ago, still impacting people to this day. I mean, God knows, with the power of God, we, we want the lightning bolts and thunder, but I'm telling you, it works in little bitty ways too. In little bitty ways that you don't hurt people. We've got to listen to them. Because those things matter to God. He's concerned about the feelings of everybody around him. Hallelujah. Um, well, how do we release this spirit? Well, I'm glad you asked. In 1 John 4, verse 1, it says, Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. How I many of you know we need a revelation of that? We quote that all the time as though we know what it means. Greater is he, Jesus, that's in you than he, the devil, that's in the world. Some of y'all magnify the devil way too big and you don't magnify Jesus near enough. How do you magnify the devil? By worry. Worry says it just magnifies the problem. Worry says, I don't know, I don't know. I don't. Worry is unbelief. Worry saying, I don't believe God can fix this, so I'm going to have to worry about it. And Jesus said, can you worry and add one inch to your statue? You ever try to strain and grow? You, you can't strain and grow. You're as tall as you're going to be. That's how God made you. Amen? Just, you ever worry, does it put any more money in the bank? No. In fact, it works against you because you're twisting up blood vessels. If you, if you don't get nothing today, walk home with this. And know that when you're worrying and when you're stressing, it's, a, it's unfathomable to me to hear ch children on a playground at elementary schools using the word stress. Kids are stressing on the playground at elementary schools. What is stress on a playground in the elementary school? Are you going to get hung up on the merry-go-round? That's never going to stop. Oh, my God. You're going to fall off the monkey bars? Somebody, you know, you're going to jump out of the swing and not nail the landing? Stress. Because they go home and they hear mom and dad talking about stress. Parents, be the parents. Don't talk about your financial problems around your children. Don't put that worry and stress on them. It's not their cross to bear. Uh, it's, it's not. They're supposed to be carefree, free of cares. Sometimes we, we you know, the Bible says cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. 
Uh, that word cast means throw. It's like you write down your electric bills or you take your electric bill and say, God, you got to meet this. I'm throwing it at you. And know that he'll meet it. Amen? But quit worrying about it. Quit talking about it. Quit telling your kids, turn that water off. You know how much that water costs? Kids walk around the house. All they can see is little meters on everything over the refrigerator. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. Shut that refrigerator. All in all the cold air. You think that refrigerator runs for free? No, there's... You see meters everywhere and dollar signs floating around the house. You know what that does to a child? It creates an atmosphere of stress. Well, I'm just trying to be economical. Well, whatever, whatever makes you sleep at night. What helps you? I'm just trying to be wise. I'm just, so we don't use the words fearful or, uh, or worry because those aren't really in happy terms. We use, I'm trying to be thrifty, Brother Mike. I'm just trying to be wise. Okay. And you should be wise, but there's a way of being wise without making everybody else feel the fear behind that. Wisdom is not about fear. So greater is he, Jesus, that's in us than he, than he that's in the world. We need to get a revelation of who, how great he is. You know, the Bible says, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. It's Psalms 34. Oh, magnify the Lord, not the problem. Don't talk the problem, talk the answer. Talk the answer. What does the word say? The Bible says be anxious for nothing, but with but, but with prayer and supplication. How many ever how many of y'all battle anxiety? You ever get frustrated? Ever get get anxious? Two of you. That's good. The rest of y'all be anxious the rest of the afternoon. You'll know what I'm talking about. You just start worrying and start getting anxious. You see, you, this, this little area right here gets all uptight. And... <laughs> the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplications, make a request known to the Lord. It tells you how to fix anxiety. Pray. And when you pray, you pray the answer, not the problem. You have a financial problem. Lord, I thank you that you, your word says that you you promised to meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I'm thankful I sow into the kingdom. Therefore, I have a right to reap because whatever I sow, I reap. I sow finances, so I know you're going to bless me with finances. I sow counsel or, or I sow compassion and sympathy toward people that are hurting. So when I'm hurting and I need a pair of ears to listen to me, you're always going to have a pair if you sow that. So I live by the law. I live by that law of sowing. It's a universal law. We all do whether you think you do or not. We live by the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever we sow, that's what we reap. If you have ears to hear people's problems, when you have problems, you'll have ears to hear yours. If you sow that, if you sow mercy, when you need mercy, mercy will be there because you sowed mercy. If you sow kindness, then kindness will be there when you need kindness. Whatever you plant, whatever you sow, that's what you reap. If you sow finances, then you'll get fine. See, that's how it works. And you just tell God, God, now your word says this is a law that you that you establish. The Bible says God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. God set that law in motion. So when you start to get anxious, you say, Lord, I'm thankful that I sow into your kingdom. So we part of our worship is is taking up tithes and offerings because that's one way that we, we defeat the enemy out of our lives because we, we shut the door from him messing with us financially. Because we sow finances, we have a right to reap finances. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, greater is he. When's the last time you just sat down and meditated on the greatness of your God? Some of y'all have, some of y'all, if some of y'all have trouble trusting or believing God, I'll tell you what you need to do. Some of you go, I, I know, read more scriptures on faith. No, read more scriptures on faithfulness. Read scriptures about the faithfulness of God. Read stories about where God came through, where God showed up, where God intervened. Because every time you find in the Bible God doing that for somebody else, the Bible says God's not a respecter of persons. That means he don't have favorites. What he did for Elijah, he'll do for you. What he did for Joshua, he'll do for you. What he did for Moses, he'll do for you. What he did for Peter, he'll do for you. And just fill in the blank. 
Those Bible stories in the Bible aren't just for our kids in Sunday school. And Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. <gasps> little felt boards and little lion. <laughs> it's not just for them. You ever felt? You ever been in your lion's den? You ever felt like people were just ah? But but you survived. Yeah. Hallelujah. I left my last verse. He wants us to have power, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Not where we cut the lights off and see who glows the most, although that is fun. I, um, in Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus said, "And you shall receive power after the after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, <clears throat> and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall be." Witnesses. He didn't say I'm gonna teach you, I'm gonna teach you how to witness. See, we the church thinks that witnessing is going out and giving people little tracts or whatever. Hey, read this, it's about Jesus. Hey, this is about our church. Come to our church. We have a coffee bar. We have coffee and donuts in the morning time. That's witnessing. He didn't say I'll I'll give you power to be to go, to go witnessing. He said, I'll give you power to be a witness. A witness is somebody that saw something. See, if you're going to have power in your life, you have to see something. God is going to have to reveal himself to you. I've seen the power of God so weekly in my life. I got a deliverance coming up Tuesday. I got a, a lady bringing, uh, I think, three or four people up from uh, Oceanside. The whole family's coming in for deliverance. It's going to be a great day Tuesday. Um, and as I'm praying for these people, I will see things. God will show me things, leaving them. I'll see all kinds. I'll get words of knowledge about things about their life. It's complete strangers I've never met before. God is going to turn on the TV of God, and I get to watch things about their life and help these people make a journey. I live for those moments, people. I love to see people get free. Um, he'll show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will give you power to be a witness. I mean, Jesus saw stuff. I mean, we need to see. When we see, we need a we need a revelation of who Jesus is. I had one. I had a vision that lasted over a half hour when I was a young Christian. I saw Jesus. I saw him. Talked to him. Yes, I did. I saw him tickling little children. Brother Mike, you preach to Jesus. I don't think every, not everybody knows. Well, you ought to, well, investigate. Find out what the Bible says he is. I mean, he loves children. They tried to get the kids not to be around Jesus one time. They said, hey, you kids, get out of here. Thought they were being spiritual. Jesus said, suffer the little children. No, 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 no. You let these little kids come around here. I want to hug on these kids. For such is the kingdom of heaven. I love little hugging little jets. He hugged me last week. Boy, he just latched on. I love kids. Because Christ loves kids. We need to get a revelation of who he is. Not with, don't, don't wait for me to tell you who he is. You seek and find out who he is. He'll reveal himself to you on the beach, won't he? Amen. Sitting on the beach, watching the waves. Jesus will tell you things about him. When, you, when you're going for a walk, you're walking your dog. Because it's got to do its business. Think about Jesus. Let him reveal himself to you. Get a personal revelation. Peter said one. Jesus said one time to Peter, he "said Who do people say, say that I, the Son of Man, am?" Well, some say some say you're Jeremiah because you sound like Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah had a heavy message. You read the book of Jeremiah; it's a heavy message, and it was about repentance. I mean, Jesus came and said, "Repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand." Jesus had a message of repentance because you can't know God without repentance. I don't know about you. I knew I was broke. You know, it's not hard to it's not hard to run up a run up a flag and quit when you realize you're losing anyways. I was losing the war with my call. I was I was defeated and I knew it. I just one night said I surrender. Well, I don't want to give up. Well, you're never going to tap into his life till you give up your life. You die so he can live. But if he lives, then you live. 
I don't understand the spiritual jargon you Christians use. We walk in light, not in darkness. Well, duh, the lights are on. No. When I had this vision of Christ, he revealed himself to me. You need to have a personal revelation. Peter said, Jesus said, who do people say I am, Peter? Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Isaiah, one of the prophets. Peter, who do you say I am? You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. See, flesh and blood. This is flesh and blood. I try to share the gospel with you. I try to preach the things that God puts on my heart. I try to do my best I can. And I do help some of y'all along the way. I, I believe I do. We wouldn't keep coming back if I didn't, if you didn't. But you need a personal revelation of Jesus. Nothing, nothing. You had one in a hotel room one time where the Lord showed up and talked to you. You need those encounters with him where it's like, whoa, this is real. Boy, sure, we're lucky. Luck has nothing to do with it. Jesus said, seek me and you'll find me. Purpose that you want an encounter with him, he'll reveal himself to you. You can have a, you can have a vision. You can, he can audibly talk to you. He can talk so, that still small voice. He can talk so loud to that quiet voice of your heart that it sounds audible. I, I'm so glad I heard him walking down the hallway in Kentucky 15 years ago because it, it spared me an embarrassing moment and it spared somebody else an embarrassing moment. I wasn't trying to be mean. I was trying to get a laugh out of somebody. But there's a time for that and there's a time not to. See, the Holy Spirit, it's all about timing. You know, there's a time to play, but there's a time to work too. You know, if you play all the time and don't work, you're out of balance. You do have to work. Hallelujah. If you stay up all night and you get up early, the Bible says that's stupid. It doesn't say stupid. It says not wise. You stay up to two or th three, or three o'clock in the morning watching some show and then you have to get up at five. Well, what was that for? Well, I had to see the end of that movie. You ever seen it four, four times? Oh, you just don't get it? <laughs> we stay up late and you rise up early. You're... you're and then you wonder why throughout the day you're dragging your feet and your boss is looking at you like, come on, pick it up. I mean, when you, work, when, you, when you go to work, you should work as unto the Lord. That means you should pretend Jesus is your boss, not the, not the person who works. Well, you don't know. I can't pretend. You don't know my boss, Brother Mike. He ain't nothing like Jesus. I didn't say it was like Jesus. You work as unto the Lord. You pretend that that's Jesus, so you work hard. Would you be, would you be lazy if Jesus was your boss? If he was on a construction site and every time he got in a truck and drove to another site and you all just started leaning on the shovel, he's gone. Well, that's, would you do that for Jesus? No, if Jesus was around, I'd be, I'd be getting after it. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Amen. You work as unto the Lord. It's your witness. He'll give you power to be a witness. Be. I mean, I want to be lovable. You want people to love you. Anybody want people to love you? Well, it says here that the Holy Spirit will give you power to be a witness. A witness, a part of being a witness is, is being lovable, being merciful, being kind. God wants us to become those things, not just have scripture and verses to quote to people. The Bible says, you know, the Bible says that you are living epistles read of all men. You're the only Bible some people will ever read. They look at your life. Matt Jones recently, I'm not going to uncover him, but he's been through a really tough year. You that know him, it's been a tough year, huh, Trace? Oh, yeah. That was a hearty amen. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what? Recently, an attorney said to him, now I'm, I wanted to hear an attorney said to him, sir, I've not met anybody that's gone through what you've gone through and has not been vindictive. What you have been through causes most people to be vindictive, hateful, and resentful. But you have been, you have no, no hatefulness, no vindictiveness. So that's a testimony. That's a witness. A man saying, sir, I see Jesus in you. Because that's, that's what people need to see, people. So when we're going, wow, does, does Matt Jones know a lot of Bible? He is a Bible. 
See, it's not how much you know of the Bible. It's how much of the Bible do, are you living. See, he's, he's a living. That attorney, it affected him. It says, wow, you should be mean, resentful, and angry, and almost hateful because this person has done so many horrible things to you. And yet you respond with such compassion. I don't get it. Now, is that not an open door to say, well, J-E-S-U-S. <laughs> Let me tell you where it comes from. See, that's, that is the witness. See, he became something. Now, how did he become that, Kevin? A trial. He didn't just wake up one morning and confess a few scriptures. All right, and there he was. No, he had a choice every day. The Bible says being reviled, he reviled not. People persecuted Jesus. He didn't turn around and cuss them out. He being reviled, he had to make a choice. I know you're... You're calling me names, you're saying all these things, but um, I'm not going to retaliate. Every day he had to make a choice to forgive and let it go or to hold on to it and let it produce stress, strife, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentful. And that one day that plane would fly. But he chose to leave his finger off the propeller and let Christ that's how this stuff works, people. It works in our everyday life. It doesn't just work on Sunday here in the house and during your worship service. It works in the everyday part of your life. Power to be a witness. So how, how, do, we get, how do we tap into that power? Just do it. Scientist says, just do it. Well, yeah, easier said than done. I didn't say it was easy. It's easier to be resentful. It's easier to hold a grudge. It's easier when somebody is mean to you to be mean back. That comes natural for most of us. But I didn't say it was easy, but that, it's, that's how you know you're born again. That's how you know the Spirit of God lives in you. Is You should respond one way, but you find a power giving you an ability to respond another way. It's a choice. And if you choose to respond that way, it says that, in one place it says that the Holy Spirit, he says, he will, Jesus said, he'll speak of me and give me glory. That's when you give God glory, when you respond. When that attorney said that about you, Matt, that was giving God glory because that attorney now saw with his own eyes, heard with his own ears, a testimony of Jesus Christ in the earth. That a man had the power not to retaliate, but to walk in something higher than that, which is love. He got to see Jesus. I want people to see Jesus in you guys. I don't want to see you. I want to see Jesus. They can see Jesus in us. They can. They can see Jesus in you. The Christ, the living Messiah, living through you and me. How many of y'all want that to happen? Just do it. Everybody rush up to Matt. What's your secret? The secret is just obedience. Paul said, I die daily. You know, you have to die to those emotions. He has, there's a part of him that wants to get angry, wants to say something, wants to reach. Everybody has those choices. You Every day you have a choice to say, I can respond the right way or the wrong way. I have the choice. It's easy to respond wrong, harder to respond right. But when you make the choice, it's worth it. Amen. Well, this is kind of pragmatic. Well, that's what I was shooting for. We can do this. I said, we can do this. If people at work, when you say, I'm a Christian, they all go, really? That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. That's not a good witness. Come on. No, seriously. You're serious. Are you surprised? Well, yeah. I'm, that's not good. That's not good. They should not be surprised that we are Christians. Amen? They'll know you're Christians by your love. So, how many of y'all want prayer for this? Anybody feel like you need some help with this? Me and Danielle and James. <laughs>
Wow, at least I got through three. And Carol, thank you. I reached four people today. I, woo, that's four more than last week. I'm, I'm on a roll. I was told by Kevin the other day there's like 80 people watching this, watching us on uh, YouTube. That's growing. So, thank you, Jesus. Um, we need, we do, we do need help with this. You know, the Bible says, "Pray one for another that you may be healed." Some of you are going, "I want Matt to pray for me." <laughs> well, if you want, the, if you want that kind of witness in your life, you got to sometimes go through the trials that other people have gone through to get there. And don't worry, Satan. Satan's got plenty of trials for for all of us. You get plenty of opportunities to go through trials. That's part of life. Jesus said, "In this world, you shall have tribulations. It's guaranteed. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world." We're all going to go through trials. It's how we go through them that determines whether we're going to have to go through them again. See, he's passing this test. That means he won't have to go through this one again. Not for a while anyways. Amen? But if, if he would have responded, if the attorney would have said, you know, I understand why you're so angry and you're so vengeful and you're so... See, that's not what the attorney said, but if he had said that, guess what? He's got to, If he failed the test, he's got to do this one again. How many of y'all tired of taking the same test over and over? I know somebody took four tests um, to get their license. You know why? There's four tests, different ones. They just learned each one of the tests and studied the test. Why didn't you study the book? How about we study the book instead of keep failing certain tests, and then we won't have to keep taking the test over and over again. How many of y'all want to get to another, on the other side of some of these places in your life? You're at a season, you're 30, you're 40 years old, you're going, I thought I'd be further down the road. Well, stop. If you're on the wrong road, it never turns into the right road. Stop. Look for that exit that Jesus is saying. Exit here to eternal life. Get off that road and get on the right road. Some of y'all just need to make peace with God. You need to give your heart to Jesus. You're on the wrong road. When's this going to get right? Well, this road never gets right. The Bible says it's a wide road and it leads to destruction. You need to stop the car and get out or look for that exit. Aren't, aren't, aren't you glad there's lots of exits? God, is that's what he's doing all the time, trying to get you off that wrong road to the right road. So let's do that right now. Bow your heads. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you a real simple question. Are you on the wrong road? Is, are, the, are, are you keep making the same mistakes over and over? Are you, does, is life just not going the right way? Are you keep do you keep losing in these battles because you 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 haven't won the war because you haven't surrendered before you before you leave this building you could change here's one of those exits I'm talking about right now the Lord is saying stop the car pull over here here's an exit you can get off the road that the Bible calls it the wide road that that, that leads to destruction it says many go thereby and Jesus is saying if you want to get on the straight and narrow I can show you how to turn this thing around, but you're on the wrong road. you got to get on the right road. Is anybody here this morning with an uplifted hand say, Brother Mike, pray for me. I know I'm on the wrong road. I know I'm making the wrong choices in my life. I'm making the... I've, I'm got, it's me. I'm not blaming God. I'm not blaming my parents. I'm not blaming everybody else. It's me. I just need to get on the right road. I need to surrender, give my heart to Jesus, and let him fix this thing because I'm making a mess of it. Anybody want to pray that prayer with me this morning? I see that hand, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? I see that hand. Amen. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. Amen. Amen. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Jesus, I'm tired. My, rub my poor little airplane, that rubber band is so tight. I've got so many physical things going on with my body. And I know I, I, know I create them because of the worry and stress in my life. I want to be free. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. You're, be, you're about to meet the Messiah today. Jesus. Three people raised their hand. You're about to get peace with God. All right. All right. Who else? Thank you. Amen, bro. Amen, sister. God bless you. All right. Amen. Let's make peace with God. Hallelujah. Every one of you that raised your hand, stand to your feet right now. You don't have to come down here, but I do want you to stand up for Jesus. That is the beginning of making things right with God, is that you're willing to stand up for Jesus. We're not going to sneak in the kingdom of heaven on the back row somewhere and slide in the back door with the lights down. We are going to stand up for Jesus. 
So every one of these people that are standing up right now, you're about to make peace with God. You're telling God, I want on the right road. I want to know that I know that I know that I know when I leave this building today, I have peace with God. I am right with you. I'm on the right road and I'm heading in the right direction. And I surrender. I run up a white flag. Jesus, I quit. I give up. I am no longer going to. I am no longer going to be in control of my life. I give it to him whose right it is. All right, every one of you standing, there's about 10 or 12 of you. God bless you. Pray this prayer with me. Repeat after me out loud. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. From this day forward, I'm living for Him. I run up the flag. I surrender. Jesus, take control of my life. Lead me out of this wilderness. And I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you sit down, everybody just down. I want you to look around the room, put body, body of Christ. Not here to embarrass anybody. These are new brothers and sisters in Christ. These are people who want to make peace with God. You go up to them after church and give them a hug and say, "Hey, you can pick and choose your friends. You're stuck with your relatives. I'm your brother, your sister in Christ. God bless you, Hoss. You're gonna make a journey. Hallelujah, Mr. James. I'm gonna help you. Wow, grasshopper. I'm going to teach you ways of the force. It's all good. Miss Chuckles, God bless you. Hallelujah. You keep on chuckling. Hallelujah. Are we all happy? Yes. Man, some people met Jesus today. That's, that's, that's serious. They heard the gospel and they let go. And that, I'm happy for that. I want you all to enjoy this week. Next week, we're going to start our home fellowship thing. I want you guys next week, if, go to the places you're supposed to go. Get to know, well, I don't know these people. Well, that's the whole idea is to get you meeting people that you don't know so you can find out that all these people are cool and have fun. And you'll have fun. If you're coming to my house, we will have fun. I got Billy Bob teeth for all of us. We'll all sit around and hee <laughs> hee. No, just kidding, just kidding. But get out and we're going to have fun and fellowship next week with one another. Enjoy this week. Go around, tell everybody, hug some people. Have a baby. And in your, in your, in your baby do like two weeks? Two weeks. Three weeks. Well, I tell you, we got some we got some women in this house. They're doing swell. I'm telling you, I'm really really proud of them. All right, you're dismissing Jesus' name.